Hello, everybody. If you thought I was blue before, just look at me now. I think I found a system that really works for me. I'm back to where these first three icons represent my first three screens. I don't think I even quit out of everything before I started shooting this work session. So let me go close and stuff and start my discussion as if I actually thought ahead to show you stuff for this video. This is a very impromptu video. Sometimes my journal entries and my, you know, current work becomes uh, the subject of videos, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, more often than not, it just ends up as a uh, invisible, you know, experience to most of the world. Uh, I'm not projecting it through media. I'm putting it on a blog that is, like, not linked at all. And I guess I'll show you that as I establish my three apps, one per screen. This first one is a full screen command line interface, CLI. Even though that guy I'm starting to watch DJ something, I got to remember his name because he puts out some good videos. But he says, it's the terminal or the shell. It's not the command line interface. He says he wishes people would stop calling it that. I'm here to tell you that as opposed to a graphical user interface, right? That's very clear, a graphical desktop. You need language to describe type in user interface in general, and you can't say that type in user interface every time. And you might be tempted to want to say shell for like the bash shell and the corn shell, or you might want to say terminal because it's term software, like the all teletype machines, TTY, if you want to get even more obscure. But amongst all these obscure phrases, there is one that um, really describes it. The command line interface. It's an interface where you put commands on lines. That's why Vim was such a big deal, a full screen editor, such as it is, still is this day. But when it came out way back, 1976, 77, it was early on during the Unix days, the ability to just edit things on any line you want was a big deal. A editor that let you take command of the full screen and it, you know, mice were not a thing and track pads, touch pads, whatever you they call them, were not a thing then much. Uh, so they had to figure out how to do it all with just keyboards. So Vim is a language. You should all understand that when I promote Linux, Python, Vim, and Git. I'm talking about something. I'm talking about a philosophy. Not too far off from the Unix philosophy. Well, <laughs> What that is is debated. Is what that is is debated. Because the Wikipedia page screwed it up. So says this YouTuber guy who I'm listening to, who was around during. He's not like some big wig guy, but he was always using the tools and he talks very candidly, very naturally. Uh, should I try and find them? So that's what I put on the next screen. On this one first, I'll just pull up Jupiter because now when I think in terms of absolute positions, I want to think out loud and capture my thoughts. That's screen one, always there. Currently in public mode because everything here goes Drum roll, please. On screen three. Again, the three first three screens. First three icons. So what goes here? You guessed it. Edge. 
and uh, it defaults to Google as my main home page. And here we can naturally ask that question. No, it's actually at YouTube I want to ask that question. So I'll go to YouTube. And hopefully if I just start typing this guy's name, it'll come up. Maybe I'll see him here. Oh, yeah, I was looking, reviewing my last video. Automate browser with Playwright. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> DJ. DJ Linux. <laughs> that would be a good name, huh? Let's see if he comes up. Uh, I should think of his, uh, one of his topics. Oh, there he is. This guy here. DJ. Who's that? DJ Ware. This guy, DJ Ware, highly recommended. His stories are wonderful. He's like what I wished I was. When I can talk about things, you know, semi-casually, semi-relaxed and with expertise of having been there, done that, I really only go back as far as the late Commodore days. So I came on board Commodore Computers, Commodore Business Machines, in their Westchester, Pennsylvania office, after Jack Tremiel was gone. He's no longer... So, I walked into one of the biggest strange situations in computer history. So, Jack Tremiel basically bought the Amiga computer for Commodore while Commodore still belonged more or less to Jack Tremiel, even though it was a publicly traded company. He really planned on handing management down to his sons, and he made no secret of it. So, nepotism and uh, treating a public company as if it was your own was not really um, smiled upon by major investors like Irving Gould, who uh, was, I think, a Canadian, if I, if I remember correctly, uh, you know, billionaire of his days, kind of person who people, you know, might talk about today uh, up in those echelons as one of the rich people, you know, uh, who owns everything. But he owned Commodore, at least the majority and enough share to kick out uh, Irving Gould from his own company. So just as, I mean, to kick out Jack Tramiel from his own company. So just as Jack Tramiel bought the Amiga from the ex-Atari engineers that had developed it as their own company, but ran out of money. And so both Commodore and Atari were interested and Commodore somehow won the deal. And Commodore was, by some strange coincidence, in Westchester, Pennsylvania, which was about a 40-minute drive from where I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And boy, did I really uh, enjoy that. It was such a bizarro world. And I was like, what are they doing out here in the middle of nowhere in the suburbs? All the action is in the West Coast, the Gold Coast. And I thought I missed all the action. I thought everything interesting was out there where, you know, computers were invented and stuff. Little did I know, most of that action was going on right here in, um, in New Jersey. Uh, what was that? The uh, Bell Labs. New Jersey. Murray Hill, I think they call it, which is always confusing to me because there's also a Murray Hill, I think, in, you know, uh, in New York. But. And the current one is owned uh, by Bell, by Nokia, right? Uh, the property, which was the legendary Bell Labs, where all this Unix stuff was developed, among many other things. Uh, came from uh, that location, and that's where, you know, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie and all that early Unix magic happened. Uh, but they borrowed philosophies from a lot of other people who were working there at the time. Uh, Unix philosophy. So this is the page that I've heard 
uh, this guy complain about. He's like, oh, they got that wrong or at least out of proportion because they always talk about how uh, it's about uh, piping and how everything's a file in the file system and uh, programs are written uh, with that in mind. So they're short, multifunction, but within their problem domain, tightly within their problem domain, so that you could send the output of one thing to the input of the other. So it all comes together into this almost timeless interface, timeless user interface. I wouldn't be wasting my time with this if what they did back there weren't so uh, on the money with making a natural system you can just be at one with and get into the zone. So this kind of stuff gets published over time at mikelev.in slash blog. And you can just go to the home page and follow the blog link, but uh, here it is. So all the stuff I've been talking about lately has been kind of accumulating here. And, uh, you know, I'm never not working on this stuff. Sometimes I mix some personal stuff in, but for the most part, related to work and technology and uh, resisting obsolescence. That's kind of how I'm billing myself now. If you go to the homepage, helping you fight obsolescence, right? I feel, you know, people look for their mission, right? They're at Kagai. I've talked about that a lot in past videos and it's that union of uh, what you love the people people what you love what the world needs uh, what you what you're good at and what you can get paid for so here in the middle, if you're getting paid for stuff that you love to do, which is also what you're good at and which is what the world needs, you have achieved a, a, a Kagai. And I'm looking to achieve a Kagai. Now, you know, ultimately, I believe it's helping my child come into this world uh, well and be equipped up here in the mines. But to the world in general, it's a similar goal. So I guess the end of that is... M-I-K-L-E-V dot I-N slash blog, right? So if you're not hearing from me, you could be reading from me. You just go and check over there, and chances are I got something going on that I'm talking about. Uh, that was under the blog. And so just uh, this one here has a YouTube video in it, right? Because my topic recently has... I've been loudly complaining that Microsoft was treating its, you know, 75% of its user base as really second-class citizens, all right? So if we search on Windows 10 and we go to its Wikipedia page, I am sure Microsoft is not really thrilled about this fact, but despite Microsoft's hardest attempts at getting people off of Windows 10 and onto a Windows 11, boy, I really get it. Wikipedia, ne Wikipedia needs money, folks. Donate to Wikipedia. Microsoft initially... There it is. As of August 2022, Windows 10 is estimated to have 72% share of Windows PCs. So of all Windows-based you know, PCs, laptops, everything that's out there, still almost three quarters are still just Windows 10. So when I talk about Windows 10, and I remain on Windows 10, it's always nagging in the back of my mind that, you know, Windows 11 is where the power users are, just like with developers, Max is where the power developers are. But I'm not talking to all those power user people. I am not in the league of these, like, hardcore developers. I'm a casual user. I'm a compulsive user. You know, I've got my habits, okay? Call me what you will, right? 
this day and age, they would go, oh, he's just autistic. Who knows? I don't know. But I do know that I like this on screen one. I like, I like this on screen two. And that's what the video is about. And this on screen three. So if you go into my blog, you can find the link to that video that talks all about. Hello, everybody. Plan that piece of software. Momentum. Did I get up to that? Yeah, I did. So it's browser automation. I show it. I, I've talked about browser automation enough in my videos, and it's now time to show it. And I think it's really cool that Microsoft no longer treats its 72% 72% of users like second class citizens. Not to be classist about it, but it doesn't feel good to have uh, WSLG <laughs> comes to Windows. 11 first and seemingly after a while only right we lost hope right so you know people like me invested a lot of times to get graphics anyway when we needed it occasionally on linux which was just occasionally you know it's mostly about the command line folks you know when we're talking linux Yeah, it's a kernel. And no, it's not a desktop. But come on, folks. It is the commands and the command line interface. Whether... DJ Ware likes me calling that or not. Okay, right? It's mostly about the command line interface, but occasionally it's about the graphics, right? So this just to enforce code style, this to do a couple of uh, library imports and uh, constant settings of values. And then this, which does what I did in the last video. But, uh, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, it was, did it exactly right. Headless is true. Headless is true. So you don't see the Linux-based browser pop up. But this is Linux, ladies and gentlemen. Notice the forward slashes in here and not the backslashes. This makes a huge difference. Why? Why does this make such a big difference? Because you can take anything you do here and extract a .py file. I'm going to get back to nbdev. I knew I was on the verge of doing it before, but this came up and that came up. But nbdev is not out of my system. I think that's going to be part of my core tools. And it revved to, I think, version 2, and it broke all my past scripts. I think they had upgrade scripts, but it, you know, again, other pressing matters. So I'm going to approach nbdev as if from scratch. I'm not going to worry about upgrades and conversions. I'll go back and revisit that other stuff later. But we'll be able to take this automatically extracted .py file and having it run as part of a systemd service right here on this machine, you know, quote, natively. And there's a little bit of debate going on these days. Windows is the best development the dev platform. Everyone says dev is the best dev platform these days. Why? Because Linux isn't uh, non-native. 
It's weird, but NT is paying off. Whereas Apple took up Linux. No, took up Unix. Uh, and I think it was Stephen Alfram of, you know, uh, Wolfram Alpha that um, suggested it. Where, whereas Apple took up Unix and hasn't provided a free and open source software repository colloquially known as a repo Microsoft took up Linux and offers the Ubuntu uh, repo And almost everything about Windows is acceptable. And it comes pre-installed on all the cheap, high-quality laptops. You know, yeah, all the counter-arguments... I know. And that hardware, you know, native Linux, is in my future. I passed up on some of the Black Friday deals on the really cheap uh, Chromebooks. There was a Dell one that tempted me for like 80 bucks. I could have had a Chromebook, 80 bucks. I just didn't want to spend the extra 80 bucks. It's better spent on my kid or whatever. So, um, there's nothing wrong with being on a Linux laptop. What's occurring here is that, you know, the joke, it's turtles all the way down. We've all heard of it that somewhere, some version or other. Yes, but it's turtles all the way down. There's a bottom turtle. When it comes to hardware, and hardware is almost always proprietary. So why not the bottom turtle too? And that's NT. NT is like a hypervisor. Few want to call it an operating system, but the thing, but the, yeah, the thing that manages resources divvying out system space on today's multi-core hardware or multi-core processors If you want to call it an operating system, that thing, right, end of sentence, but it's an OS. We call it a hypervisor. And really, that's the, you know, next technology. I think it was next or new technology. What did NT stand for anyway? What did NT stand for? Mm, not the kind of... Not gaming. 
I guess you gotta use it's been enough years. Has it been that long? Just the Wikipedia NT page. Yeah, NT was formally expanded to new technology, but it no longer carries that meaning. So the new technology of NT of NT was to isolate resource, you know, isolate code, isolate running code. From each other, assuming multiple running code, and you know, allow that divvying out of resources to occur. Better than Unix ever handled that. Better than Unix. So these things were born in different times. Unix was born in the 70s when everyone was happy just to get all this stuff working and the human aspects of the workflow was the most important thing. NT was developed years later after all the debacles of security and viruses and trojans and worms of the uh, early Microsoft days from 3.1 probably up through Windows 97 95 was a big version, but then they went to Windows 97. And all through those times, mostly, uh, those machines were vulnerable in all kinds of ways. So Microsoft put a lot of effort into creating uh, their new technology, and this was after they helped IBM work on OS 2. So they had a lot of recent uh, lessons on their mind, and they knew how to do it. And... Uh, fast forward to today, that has really benefited the um, Windows subsystem for Linux. It's exactly the kind of thing NT was made for. Get it? So, so many like long bets that Steve Jobs made for Apple have paid off, you know, and, uh, you know, exponentially over the years, right? It's amazing how right Steve Jobs has been about most things over the years. But Mac doesn't offer FOSS. Yes, homebrew. I know. But put homebrew up against the Ubuntu software repo inheriting from the Debian software repo. Debian is the FOSS brains behind Ubuntu, right? Um, how do I put it in everyday terms? You know, Debian uh, <laughs> are some of the best good guys, good guys, that's, you can't say guys anymore, right? Best good folks, folks, that can neutral gender, gender neutral. Uh, some of the best good folks of the FOSS community. Read <laughs> their, uh, I guess it's charter or whatever. They are as close as it gets to 
massively influential without being corporate corrupt. And many of the things in FOSS are in danger of becoming corporate corrupt, right? Linux, Python, Vim, and Git. Microsoft bought all of it. But you can't buy Linux, right? But you can, you know, join the Linux Foundation and uh, throw your weight behind. Uh, I don't know. There's so many things you can you can finish that sentence with at this point, but. Uh, Let's just say Ubuntu. And that would be versus Red Hat, which I think has now been officially bought by IBM. They've always been sort of funded by IBM to help Linux become, you know, mission critical or infrastructure ready or whatever words you want to put on it. So it was, a, and that's a whole uh, branch of uh, a lineage of uh, Linux inheritance which is very different from debian and ubuntu they're on different sides of that you know camp so microsoft sort of split the linux community or strengthened what what some might call the less strong side of the coalition ubuntu without microsoft is less influential and powerful than ubuntu with microsoft that's why everyone's flocking away from the ubuntu you know uh desktop now nothing wrong with it but everyone likes to say they don't like it anymore i don't like ubuntu anymore well you know they're clearly lapdogs of microsoft now and that's okay so why ubuntu if debian is doing it all it's because uh you know derivative linux as in not the first uh you know node on the branch derivative linuxes is that the plural of linux uh, get to focus on things like drivers right that makes these repos popular because they run on a lot of hardware and support a lot of peripherals that's not easy that may be the hardest part all hardware is different broad hardware support is difficult in the FOSS world and that's what Ubuntu does which by the way is canonical <laughs> which is funny because Microsoft is making Canonical's version of Linux canonical. Some of the ironies here is that, you know, uh, Ubuntu's, you know, repo system isn't POSIX compliant. If you read POSIX, if you read the POSIX standard, it's got to come with RPM. Red Hat package management system. Debian don't. Ubuntu either. So technically, all us, you know, Ubuntu users are not 
plastics. Compliance. And that normally would really rub me the wrong way for me to have jumped onto a platform that really isn't abiding by the standard. Now, what's actually happening, though, is that written standards from Unix, the, from the era of Unix, is not really defining the future. The future is being defined by FOSS. Unix was not necessarily the FOSS, the free and open source spirit, out of the gate. That came in time as all the intellectual property stuff was worked out. Linux was born in FOSS. Linux was born in the free and open source community. So I guess I'll wrap up there because I've been shooting for a while. But I, I had a lot of that stuff to get off of my, uh, to, to, to get out of my head that I wanted to talk about. Particularly the joy of getting back to my arrangement there because Microsoft really threw things into disarray when they backtracked on their, not backtracked, but Microsoft made all those goodies previously on just Windows 11 available suddenly on Windows 10. Wow, did I have to adjust my tooling. I had to give up my fixation on LXD Linux containers for a while because just plain old WSL had everything I needed. I still hate <laughs> the uh, API and the uh, command line command line the command the command line command syntax I'll say syntax versus LX I'll put LX LX D's and which is LXC neither of them are are, are a, <laughs> pleasure. LXC has its idiosyncrasies. LXC uh, execute Jupiter. This is like ingrained in my head now. Hyphen hyphen space SU space hyphen hyphen login Ubuntu. Oh my god is that a lot to type. So at least it supports aliases, right? Making aliases is uh, built in so you can make like LXC space uh, some arbitrary word or something. I don't know. Well, anyway, um, these are the types of things that they absorb into you over time. You internalize them. Your expertise becomes a part of it. And some of these things just don't make the transition to the modern world. There's two things called said and awk are not as popular as they used to be. Mo <laughs> modern, yeah, modern all-purpose programming languages have mostly taken their place in the hearts and minds of developers. But there's hardly any getting away from commands like the CD less uh, I don't know for some of the you know these are the super easy ones but over time you'll also have to uh, C, C 
ch mod ch own <laughs> change the uh, file permissions and the file ownerships and this kind of stuff over time you do it enough and you wrap your mind around users and groups and what root is all about you really understand things in general right after a time you understand Linux parentheses Unix in general and you can do a lot of things casually without being a hardcore programmer career programmer Programming is just literacy. Think in Linux, Python, Vim, and Git. I'll talk more some other time about why Python and get I think Linux and Vim <laughs> are obvious enough from uh, videos like this so don't hate Microsoft they make the bottom turtle Let FOSS be your turtles all the way up. Unless you're a graphic designer, in which case you need Adobe. And I guess that's about it, right? <clears throat> that covers a lot of uh, pressing thoughts and... Uh, carries you through my whole thing. Now, if I were to want to publish this, I can leave this like this because I know what Markdown's going to do, so I just give those bullet points. I use my keyboard shortcut for give this a headline, and uh, the bottom turtle is Microsoft. And that's okay. Save. Ampersand P for publish. Oh, I gotta fix something because every time I do this, I mess that piece of the puzzle up. Uh, this is the script was from back when I had GitHub there. So interrupt, press enter, or type command to continue. So I interrupted that, and then I'll fix that. That's worth seeing. So let's go to uh, B last, last buffer. Search on GitHub, change word, uh, turn that into uh, repos, change word, repos. Okay, got rid of all the path references to GitHub, replaced it with repos, I quit out of it. Oh, and the script that couldn't run before can now because... Uh, hmm, no, no, I didn't see the slice and dice work. So we're going to have to go back into that by... Uh, CD, uh, I guess I'll just go right to my journal, Vim journal, <coughs> Ampers, <coughs> Ampersand P, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, 
Now you'll see the slicing. And now it's pushing out to GitHub. And I know I'm on screen one, so two screens to the right, and I'll be on a browser, and I can just type uh, this address in. Now, it might take a while to publish, so what I'm actually showing you is that blog post that I had just uh, finished. It has now just been pushed up to GitHub, and will be one of the blog entries. about here. I could sit here and refresh or I could just end the video. Well, that'll give you something to come look for, right? Because that'll be the bottom turtle is Microsoft and that's okay. And then I'll come back later and link the YouTube video into it. Now when this happens and it's like, oh, why is it taking so long? Is it on its way to doing it? I usually actually use Chrome for a lot of this stuff, and now I'm on screen four. That's special because it's something that varies from my normal routine. And then I have this icon here. If I'm logged into GitHub, it'll show me how far things along are, are in deployment. And it says inactive. Oh yeah, that's the older one. So this one is active, right? So that must have been released by now. It must have reached uh, no. Interesting. Deployed active. I thought it would say in process. If it really is uh, this by doing that uh, commit here or that publish ampersand p for publish. This should have put that into a uh, being processed mode. This repo has grown very large. You don't see it here with just these blog files, but the repo itself is ginormous because it's my old history of my old website going back as far as I've been able to preserve it. It's been through WordPress exports to Markdown files. So these pushes are taking a little bit longer than I would like, and I'll share the pain with you because, you know, see it through to the end, right? I get annoyed by not really knowing what's uh, going on there, which is why I made those uh, repo icons. Oh yeah, that's in uh, Chrome over here. Uh, there, in progress. I knew there was an in progress coming. I knew that couldn't be right. So the one that is active was from six hours ago. The one that's in progress is from 34, 35 seconds ago, 36. That's interesting. Look at that countdown. It's actually changing in front of your eyes. Now, the question is whether it's some doing some back-channel communication to change in progress to active. I don't know if it is. It may have some value in hitting refresh. And look, it changed to active, so now we should be able to go over here. And there it is. The bottom turtle is Microsoft, and that's okay. And so there's our journal entry from today included in the blog post. Oh, the previous one lacks a headline. So whichever this is, I'm gonna have to give that headline later, but I won't make you suffer through that process again. But there you go, welcome to my world. Thanks for joining me. See you soon, and don't forget to subscribe.